Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the stage, Dr. John Minardi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fabulous. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I can hardly see you because I'm getting blinded by the spotlights here, but I'm going to trust you're all out there. I want to start off how I start off every seminar, and it's this. I'm a practicing chiropractor. Monday to Friday, I adjust people in my clinic. I make my living $40 at a time, just like every other chiropractor in this room. About 35 to 40 weekends a year, I do teach uh, in our great profession because my main passion in chiropractic is that we are certain in what we do. I want a certain, I want when people walk into your office and they say, um, can chiropractic help me get pregnant? Can chiropractic help boost my immune system? That your answer is a resounding yes, but not just because you believe. I don't want you to believe. I want you to understand. If you can understand, then you can explain it to somebody else. And as soon as you can explain it to somebody else, that is when we become truly powerful as educators. You know, you all know that the term doctor is, is, is teacher, but how often are we teaching our patients? How often are we teaching another health uh, professional on the power of what we do? And for a long time, I fell into that hole where I wasn't teaching. I wasn't educating my patients, I wasn't educating other professionals, and I just fell into my own little rut of adjusting people every day. So, you know, uh, the general came up here and, and she talked about passion and purpose, and Dan came up here and he talked about his passion that he wants back. You know, and, and I kept hearing the word passion over and over, and I would describe myself as a pretty passionate guy, but I never really understood the word passion until I watched my good friend, Dr. Jeffrey Conningame, talk about it in Vegas Parker just this past year. And if you don't know Dr. Jeffrey Conningame, if you've never seen him speak before, you're doing yourself an enormous disservice because he's one of the smartest men that I've ever met, one of the best speakers in chiropractic. And not only is he a DC, he's also a PhD, and now he's also doing his MD so that he can actually educate patients on why they shouldn't be on drugs. So extremely intelligent man, extremely intelligent man. And just happens to be one of my best friends and brothers, but anyway. He said to me, he looked right at me in the crowd and he said, Dr. Minardi, do you know what passion means? Do you know what the root of passion is? And I said, no. And he said, passion, the root word of passion comes from suffering. That it actually pains you when you can't do the very thing you love to do. Passion is not excitement, that's excitement. Passion is not dedication, that's dedication. Passion is that there's an actual suffering behind it if you cannot do what you love to do, what you were put on this earth to do. And that's why I tell you that my biggest passion is educating chiropractors and making them certain in what they do because that's what makes us all powerful. And that's why I'm here today. So I wanna talk a little bit about the power of chiropractic and I want to talk a little bit about the neurology of chiropractic, but I want to talk about it in a way where we can all understand it. We're not going to use a whole lot of big words and all this kind of stuff. I just want you to get what we do. And the biggest thing that I would like you to understand, if you can get anything from my talk, anything at all, it's this. Chiropractic has a direct effect on the brain. Every time you adjust somebody, you're not putting a bone back in place. For my CAs in this room, every time someone walks into the clinic and the chiropractor does a chiropractic adjustment, they're not putting a bone back in place to take pressure off a nerve. That's not true. That is simply untrue. Every time you adjust someone, you have a direct positive impact on the brain. And every time someone is, is not adjusted and they're subluxated, it has a direct negative impact on the brain. You see, we, for a long time in chiropractic, we explain chiropractic like this. Okay, bone out of place puts pressure on nerve equals bad. That was, ba that was our basic premise that we taught people. But the thing is, that only happens 10% of the time. 
90% of the time is the brain is getting flooded with a ton of abnormal information because of the subluxation. And every time we adjust them, we correct that abnormal in information with positive information. How do we do that, you ask? Because we have a direct effect on this guy up here called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is a very special feature in the brain, and in my opinion, it's the most important feature we have to understand as chiropractors. Why? Because the hypothalamus links to the most of two important systems in our body. It links the nervous system to the hormone system. It links the nervous system to the hormone system. Every time you're subluxated, you have negative stress hormones being released in the body. Every time you adjust people, you stop that process and flood it with positive hormones. But how do you do that? You do that by the connection to this guy right here called the hypothalamus. And if you've ever read anything on the hypothalamus in the past, you'll read things like this. Um, it maintains balance, it maintains homeostasis, it brings back things back to a set point, and that's all good. But most of the time when people hear things like it maintains balance, they'll think of like a teeter-totter. So they think that the brain is like this. Something's kind of out of balance, and now I'm going to put it back in balance, and that's how balance works in the brain. That couldn't be more inaccurate. Balance in the brain is not static. Balance in the body is not static. You're constantly changing all the time. Keeping balance means keeping balance in an ever-changing environment. It's not like a teeter-totter, that's too static. What I want you to think of, <clears throat> what I want you to think of is this. I want you to think of keeping balance in the body, like if I was up here right now and I'm a juggler and I have 10 tennis balls in my hand and I start juggling 10 tennis balls. If I start juggling 10 tennis balls, there's balance in that, but it's always changing. You guys with me on that so far? So how on earth does the hypothalamus hook up the nervous system to, to the hormone system? How does it do that? Let me change the words a bit on you, okay? It hooks up the electrical stimulus to the chemical messenger. See. The nervous system is the electrical stimulus. It's going to start something. But the actual messenger is a chemical. And depending on the chemical or the hormone or the neurotransmitter that's released, it will lead to the behavior of the person. Okay? Everything starts in the brain. Everything starts with the nervous system, but there's going to be a hormone release at some point, and that will give you behavior. Okay, so let me show you a little, uh, let me show you a little video on this. Everything starts in the brain. If we get real close to a neuron, you see all that light that's happening there. Those are electrical stimulus. The electrical stimulus is priming the hormone system. When it primes the hormone system, it says, depending on the behavior that I want, I will have specific hormones be released. Nervous system, hormone system. So depending on what I need, I'm going to release certain hormones. So when you see it come right at the very end of a nerve, what gets released? It's not electricity, it's chemicals. And depending on what chemicals released and gets through that little hole there, that will mean the behavior that ends up on the other side. So when the person's all contracted walking into your office or aggressive or really, really irritable, that's a perfect example of something like when adrenaline is released. If someone's happy all the time and people are happy-go-lucky and they want to give you a hug, that's a perfect example of when something like serotonin or dopamine is released, like, like a feel-good hormone. Okay? So electrical stimulus, hormones being released as the chemical messenger later on. So if we go back to my analogy now, that if you think of me up here balancing a whole bunch of tennis balls, that's how the nervous system is constantly maintaining balance in the body. Okay? Totally good. Now, let me ask you this. Let's pretend. Let's pretend I give each and every one of you another tennis ball. And I say one at a time, what I want you to do is lob another tennis ball to me. So I'm juggling 10 tennis balls right now. At some point, you'd agree with me that by the 16th, 17th person, they're gonna lob one more tennis ball and I can't quite catch it, okay? I can't quite juggle it into the rest of my balls that I'm already juggling. So let me ask you a question. On that 17th tennis ball coming to me, 
do I just drop that last ball or do I drop everything? Which one is it? I drop them all, right? Because if my timing is off on that 17th tennis ball, then what happens to the rest of me? My timing is off on everything, so everything drops. Would you agree with me? That is called, the technical term for that is called allostatic load. That's the point at which your body can no longer maintain balance anymore. So the body can juggle a lot of different stress. The body's juggling constant little things all the time, but it'll get to one point where it says, I can't do this anymore, and it drops that last tennis ball. As Soon as it drops that last tennis ball, though, it drops all the tennis balls, and that is the start of disease and illness. Disease and illness comes from the body not being able to maintain balance anymore. You guys with me on this so far? So here's the thing. Why else do I give you this analogy? Because what I just told you is also how the hormone system works. The hormone system works the exact same way. You cannot affect just one hormone without having a direct effect on a ton of other hormones. Okay, the, let me give you an example, all right? Let me give you an example. I'm a lot, I'm very much into fitness. I work out at two different gyms, okay? One gym that I work out is what I would call my family fitness gym. People like you and I work out there. And then my other gym is what I call my juicer gym, okay? Do you guys know what a juicer is? Yes, some of you do, some of you don't. A juicer is someone who takes anabolic steroids, okay? So the people at this particular gym that I go to they're all into powerlifting, bodybuilding. They're, they outweigh me by about 100 pounds, okay? Here's the thing, why do I bring this up? This one day, I was talking to one of these individuals who's a client of mine and a friend, and I said, you know, Stefan, um, I'm worried, brother. Like, you, you're taking all these drugs, and I'm worried about your health, and as your chiropractor, as your friend, you know, is there any way we can get you off of this stuff? He goes, oh, Dr. John, it's a real science. And I said, really? Now, let me describe Stefan to you. Stefan is five feet tall and five feet wide. Okay? He's got arms bigger than my waist, all right? So when a guy that looks like Hulk Hogan looks at you and says, you have to understand the hormone system, it piques my interest a bit, okay? <laughs> so I looked at him and I said, explain to me what you mean. And he said, you see, you have to understand the hormone system to keep the delicate balance of the human body, Dr. John. And I went, really? Explain some more. And he said, you see, People think, he goes, have you ever heard of roid rage or have you ever heard of like all these crazy side effects that people who take steroids do? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, see, that's a person who doesn't understand how to balance the hormone system of their body. And I said, tell me more. And he says, all right. He said, if I take one hormone, it's gonna affect other hormones, so I have to be able to balance out other things. And I said, give me an example. And he said, okay. Most people look at me and they see my size and they see what I do and they think, that all I do is inject massive amounts of testosterone and everything will take care of itself. He said, but nothing can be further than the truth. He says, I start with testosterone. And I said, okay. And he says, so I inject testosterone because I want to get bigger, I want to get stronger, I want to do all these things to my muscles. And I said, okay, okay. And he says, but as soon as I inject testosterone, my own body will shut down its own natural production of testosterone. Because if the brain reads in the blood, there's 10 times the amount of testosterone, your brain thinks, well, I don't need to make my own. Okay, that's called downregulation. He didn't tell me that, but I knew that already. So he said, he said, so that's the first thing I do. And I said, okay. He said, but I don't want my own natural testosterone to be shut off. He said, so I have to take another drug called HCG. And I said, what does that do? He goes, well, HCG tells my brain to release very certain hormones so that when it gets down to my testes, it'll continue to release testosterone. And I said, okay. He said, but you gotta understand, once I release a lot of testosterone, my body's gonna want to convert it into estrogen because it's just a natural enzyme of what it does naturally. He said, but I don't want that to happen. So I have to take an anti-estrogen tablet in order to balance that. And I said, all right, and he said, but you have to also understand, Dr. John, he goes, in order for me to get the size that I am and all that little muscles that I have, he says, I have to eat a lot of food. He goes, but in order for me to absorb the amount of sugars that I need to push myself in the gym, I have to inject insulin. And I said, okay. And he said, but see, once I inject insulin, I can't just think to myself, the insulin's gonna do what I want because I got a lot of calories. So then I inject growth hormone. 
okay. And then, I, and then he says to me, he goes, after I inject growth hormone, see, that's going to affect my thyroid hormone, so I have to do something to balance thyroid hormone. He went on and on and on for another five minutes of all the plethora of hormones and drugs that he had to take to balance everything out. You understand me? See, but this started with testosterone. This started with one hormone that was out of balance, and now we had to have a whole rearrangement of what's going on. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, crazy juicer, what's he doing, right? But let me ask you a question. What do you think happens when an individual walks into a fertility clinic and gets fertility treatment? What do you think happens? Because you're a juicer. You just use different juice, okay? Because, and I've, I've spoken about this in the past, and someone says, but you can't compare a person who wants a baby with a person who's just trying to get big. Actually, on a physiological level of their hormones, I can compare them identically. I'm not talking about their motivating factors. That's irrelevant to me. I have to understand what's going on with their body. Because as soon as a woman goes into a fertility clinic, you know what the very first thing that they do is? They say, well, you need a lot of estrogen and progesterone to get pregnant. So I'm either going to inject you with estrogen and progesterone or we're going to give you a suppository of that. But what happens in the body? See, as soon as I increase estrogen and progesterone, my brain wants to shut off its own production. So they say, no problem. We're going to give you gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is going to release hormones from your brain to go to your ovaries and continue to release estrogen. But guess what? You need a lot of luteinizing hormone, to, in, or it's called a luteinizing spike, to maintain pregnancy. So I'm going to inject you with luteinizing hormone at some point. Are you guys with me? We started with estrogen. All of a sudden, I have a plethora of things that have changed in the hormone system, right? So let me ask you this. What happens to our young women when they're on birth control? What do you think happens? Because, what, I mean, let, let me ask you this. A lot of women who are on birth control, they go in, they're 15, 16 years old, they go to their medical doctor and they say, you know, I, I don't want to get pregnant, put me on birth control, no problem, boom, they put, put on birth control. How does birth control work? Birth control works because when you take these tablets, it jacks up the amount of estrogen and progesterone over the level where you cannot get pregnant. That's why as soon as you stop taking that pill, you'll instantly get your cycle at the very end of that month. And then you'll continue the pill and it'll stop everything again. But again, if you increase the amount of progesterone and estrogen, what happens to the brain? It stops its own production of it because it says I have 10 times the amount in my blood. Why should I produce my own? Okay, then 10 years go by and a female says, you know what? I want to go off the pill now. I want to get pregnant. I want to have a child. So now they're 26 years old. They go off the pill. They think, I should get pregnant. I'm normal. Everything's good in the world. But do they get pregnant easy sometimes? They don't. Some people do. Some people don't, right? Because that, the, the way that the body resets is, is totally different depending on the individual, depending on the other toxicities that they have in their life. But the bottom line is this. I can, I can give you examples with every hormone. What about people who take insulin for diabetes? When you take insulin, you'll have a major effect on the pancreas. And as soon as you have a major effect on the pancreas, other hormones that the pancreas releases have to change. You guys with me on this? Every, how about people who take thyroid hormone? How many, like, how many chiropractors, you take a, a history and they're like, you take any medications, they're like, yes, I'm on Synthroid because I have an underactive thyroid, I have an overactive thyroid. But as soon as you affect thyroid hormone, you automatically affect growth hormone in the body. You guys understand me on this? See, if you affect one hormone, you'll have a massive effect on the other hormones in the body. So the body has a harder time balancing all of those balls. See? So now, this all leads to this, which is called the stress response. Now, the stress response is this. The stress response basically means when the body is subjected to something that stresses it out, it will react in a very similar way. Now listen, it doesn't matter if the stress comes from a physical source, a chemical source, or an emotional source, the brain will always react the same way, which means it's gonna release very specific hormones into the blood. Please, if you're gonna make a note, this is the one to make. The subluxation is a stressor to the brain. And I'm gonna show you that in a second. Every time someone is subluxated, it causes a stress response to occur in the brain. So that means every time someone's subluxated, specific hormones are being released into the blood 
that are gonna cause very specific behaviors to occur in men and women. Now, people always ask me this, they say, but Dr. John, the stress response is an innate thing inside of us. If it's so bad, why do we even have it? I don't get it. Listen to this, please. The stress response is good for you, short term. Short term, the stress response will save you. The stress response gets you out of a bad situation. Short term, it's good. Those hormones are great for you short term. It's the long term release of those same hormones that will kill you over time. Because the stress response was only supposed to be there for two minutes, three minutes, and then it's over. And then everything goes back to normal again. But what happens if the stressor nova goes away? What happens if you're in a terrible marriage? What happens if you have a terrible job? What happens if your child is sick? What happens if your subluxate had never been adjusted? Remember the tennis balls. See, people say to me all the time, they're like, John, but are you saying the VSC can just cause all these diseases? It can be that last tennis ball. It can be the point at which the body can no longer maintain balance. That's why it's so devastating to the health of the brain and body. You see, we've all heard this, right? We, have you guys heard of the term fight or flight? Have you guys heard that term before? Yes? And, the, and we usually associate with like fight or flight is the stress response, okay? But I need to correct that because that's not actually accurate. That is only accurate if we're talking about men. If a man is under stress, they'll go through classic fight or flight. That's what they'll exact. If you got me under stress, I will do exactly this. I will sit back and I'll go through fight or flight. So what does that mean? When a man's under stress these days, it's not tiger days anymore, it's today. I'll still go through the same fight or flight response, which means this. I will stand up as tall as possible. I'll widen myself out as much as possible to intimidate the individual in front of me. I'll do this all subconscious. I'll deepen my voice and raise it so that I can try to intimidate you. Now, if I'm with another man, it, that could escalate to be violent. Or if I think this person can easily beat me here, I might turn to the next thing, which is run. Okay? I might sit back and go, this guy's eight feet tall. I can't win this fight. I'm out of here, okay? You'll go through classic fight or flight. You'll start fight, so you'll argue and bicker first, and if fight doesn't work for you, you'll leave, okay? Women don't go through that response. Women go through what's called tend and befriend. Tend and befriend, which means this. When a female is under tremendous stress, they don't go through fight or flight. What they go through is tend and befriend, which means this. First, they tend to their environment. So if they have a child, they'll instantly tend to the child. So when they get home, if they're under stress, they're like, did little Johnny do his homework? Did little Johnny eat? Did little Johnny do this? They instantaneously go to the child. If they don't have a child, they'll instantaneously take care of the rest of their environment, which is, they'll be like, oh my God, there's, a, a, a di a, there's dishes in the sink, I have to scrub the toilet, I have to clean the, you know what I mean? They'll go through that type of thing. If tend, does not resolve the problem for them or doesn't relieve that stress, the next thing they go through is befriend, which means this, they'll usually pick up the phone or sit down with a friend and talk all of their problem out. See, the big thing is, is that men and women are very different under stress, very, very different. A man is looking for a resolution, they don't even care if it's a bad one. They just want it to be over, okay? <laughs> That's the truth. That is the truth, okay? Our beautiful women don't want a resolution. They just want to talk, okay? Mm -hmm. that, and, the, and the thing is, is that many men in this room, and I did for a long time, were like, but that doesn't make sense. I'm trying to tell you the answer. See, <laughs> the, right? But uh, people are like, I'm about to end a fight with my wife. Um, no, I know, I know, trust me. That's why I'm divorced. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Here's the thing. The reason a woman needs to talk about it is oftentimes they know the resolution, but that's how they get that toxicity out of them. They need to release it. They need to just talk about what's bothering them. Now, if you have a man and a woman under stress at the exact same time, now we've got a big problem because we've got different behaviors for the stress response. So what happens to the man? He, let's pretend uh, me and a female are having an argument. What happens to me? I'll go through classic fight or flight. 
I'll start to argue, I'll start to raise my voice, I'll do things that try to intimidate, but I'm not gonna fit, hit a female. So she thinks, keep talking. So then I say, this is not working, right? So what do I do? I start to walk away. But as a female, you're going through tend and befriend. So what do you do if I walk away? You'll follow me, guaranteed, <laughs> guaranteed, right? And the man is like, leave me alone. I'm trying to go into this room. And the female's like, I wanna talk, can you come over here? Okay, right? That's, I know, I know. That's classic fight or flight, tend and befriend. That's classic, that's what's happening. Why do I share this with you? Why do I share this with you? Because depending on the behaviors that are coming into your office, you can see when people are under the stress response. See, oftentimes, a wife will say something like this. They'll say, I don't know if it's just the pressure at work, or I don't get it, but he's often very irritable. He snaps at me very quickly. He's never used to be this way, but he just loses temper very, very fast. That is a perfect example of, an, of a man going through fight or flight, and they, or she might say the opposite. She might say he always wants to be alone. He locks himself in his man cave, doesn't want to talk ever. That's a man under stress, okay? The opposite is true for a female. If, if the man says something like, oh man, she, he's, she's just always spending all of her time with her kid, like it's like I lost my wife. That is a female under stress because they're constantly in tend mode. You guys with me on that? See, the big thing with all of this is if we can understand the behaviors that happen, then we can understand that it's hormones that are actually being released that are causing these behaviors. And once you understand those hormones, once you understand what they do, then you can say, aha, I'm starting to get this. See, the stress response will release very specific hormones, okay? So I have up here that the, if I can have my slide back up here, please. I have up here that the subluxation, so all of these four structures over here, those are supporting structures of the vertebrae that when you're subluxated, they get distorted, they get changed. The muscles, the tendons, the disc, all the things that support the vertebrae. When these guys get changed, they send a massive negative response to the brain. And when it gets up to the brain, the brain will release hormones that eventually, when it gets to the adrenal gland on your kidneys, will release adrenaline. And when it releases adrenaline, short term, adrenaline is phenomenal for you. Adrenaline is great for you short term. Because if I have to run from a situation, or if I have to fight somebody to save my own life, I need lots of adrenaline. Why? Because adrenaline brings blood flow to the muscles, to the heart, and to the brain so that I can um, fight off somebody. But there's only so much blood in your body. So if I give to muscles, heart, and brain, I can take from them. So who do I take from? I take from reproduction, the immune system, and the gastrointestinal system. I take from the areas you need to get pregnant I take from the areas that keep you healthy, and I take from the areas that allow you to digest food. Why? Because that's where all the energy is. So if I have to survive the next five minutes and I have to run as fast as possible away from a guy with a gun, it, does it really matter if I have any blood flow to reproduction? Does it really matter if my immune system is not gonna work in the next five minutes, if I'm not gonna survive the next five minutes? It doesn't matter. That's why short term it's a good deal long term is the problem. See, because if I have adrenaline long term, you know how people walk into your office? They walk in all contracted and you're like, oh man, like you're walking in like the hunchback of Notre Dame and you sit back and you're like, just relax. And you're like, I am relaxed, right? But they're not at all. But that's adrenaline constantly being released there. That's that constant push of blood flow to the muscles. But as soon as that happens, it shuts down reproduction. It shuts down GI system, it shuts down immune system. So let me ask you a question. For my chiropractors in this room, okay? For my chiropractors in this room. How many of you have had people walk into your office, could never get pregnant before? All of a sudden, all they've changed in their life is that they've started to see you as a chiropractor, they've had chiropractic care, and six months, a year later, whatever, they all of a sudden got pregnant, but they have no idea how. A show of hands, how many times has that happened? Can you keep your hands nice and high for me, please? Take a look around this room. Is that a coincidence? Why is that, are you right? Phenomenal, phenomenal. Is that a coincidence? 
Do, it's not a coincidence, but how does it happen? It is not because the low back hooks up to the uterus. That's not it, okay? That's not it. And people are like, but I thought it was. It's not it, okay? <laughs> it's not it. So you have to understand this. The reason people are getting pregnant under your care has nothing to do with L1. It has to do with when you adjust them, regardless of where you adjust them in their spine, you reset the chemistry of their brain. Once you reset the chemistry of their brain, their brain reallocated blood back to the reproductive system, back to the immune system, back to the GI system, back to the areas where now you can get pregnant. Those ulcers can go away. People are gonna get better when the immune system is healthier. You with me on this? See, short term, adrenaline's a good deal. Long term, it kills you. The next one that gets released is a hormone called cortisol. So same structures in the vertebrae, sending all that bad information to the brain. This time, the brain sends different hormones, and when it gets to the kidney, it's the adrenal gland, it will release cortisol. Now, some of you have probably heard of cortisol as the major stress hormone. Now, remember, cortisol short term is a good deal because cortisol short term will make new energy for you. It'll make you strong. It'll make you powerful. It's good short term. Long term, cortisol will kill you, long term. So again, what if people's stressor never goes away? What if they have that terrible marriage, that terrible life, that terrible whatever, and they're under constant stress and they're subluxating? Don't think for one second the subluxation is a major stressor because the subluxation stresses out the brain in two ways. Number one, it stresses out through the physical distortion. It's called a physical stressor. And the second thing is it's a chemical stressor because when you're subluxated, it brings massive amounts of inflammation. And when it brings massive amounts of inflammation in that area, it's now a chemical stressor to the brain. You with me? Every time someone's subluxated, and the more subluxated they are, the more negative information gets shifted up to the brain. Quick story for you. About seven or eight years ago was the very first time I was ever asked to speak in Australia. And I'm from Canada. And from Toronto to Sydney, you have one flight per day. Okay, you missed that flight, got to wait 24 hours to the next day to catch the next one, all right? Around the same time, <clears throat> I went to my medical doctor for my yearly physical, only time I ever go to my medical doctor. So he says to me, you got to get blood work done, got to get done, and I just pushed it off, pushed it off, and I said, listen, I'll do it before I go on the plane to Sydney because I have the afternoon off that day. He says, no problem. Tuesday comes, I go to the blood lab. Of course, there's a million people in the blood lab, so I'm like, okay, um, I still have time to get to the airport, no problem. I wait about an hour, and I'm like, okay, now my time is running out, right? So I walk up to the young lady at the front, I tell her my situation, I'm like, please, I gotta catch a plane. She's like, okay, go in the second room, it's moving faster. I walk in the second room, there's just as many people as the first room, right? So I'm like, okay, this isn't working out. So I finally get in, but I looked at my watch at the time, and I thought, you know, by the time I get to the airport, clear security, clear customs, there's no mathematical way I'm gonna, I'm gonna get there. There's just, that, uh, I'm, I'm starting to sweat now. So the nurse finally comes in. She goes, here, take your blood. I'm like, thank God. So she takes like every piece of blood that's in my body at this point in time, <laughs> right? I jump in my car. I fly to the airport. I just hope a cop doesn't pull me over. <laughs> finally get there, get through security, make my flight. I'm like, Whew, all is well in the world. Go to Australia, have fun down there, come back. There's a call waiting for me from my medical doctor's office. They said, have to talk to you about your blood test. So I call him up, I'm like, what's going on? He said, you gotta come in. And I said, tell me over the phone. They're like, no, nope, gotta come in, go in. The guy said, you might wanna take a seat. He's, and I said, don't be so dramatic. Like, just just tell, tell me what's going on, right? And he says, okay, we think you have a brain tumor. And I'm like, let me take a seat, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so I sat back and I went, what? Get out of here. And, and he said, uh, yes. And I said, tell me how you think I have a brain tumor. And he said, okay. He said, your blood has so much cortisol in it that the only way we've ever seen it be this high is if you have a tumor on your pituitary gland in your brain that's making this hormone be released in excessive amounts in the blood. And he said, so what we want you to do is take these pills, that'll start to shrink the tumor, and then we're gonna send you for a CT scan and we'll book you in for surgery. So I said, I appreciate that, but I'm gonna pass on that for right now. I said, so I explained to him my stress level of going to Australia, 
and I, and I said, so isn't it possible that the stress response, because I was under so much pressure to get there, caused that cortisol level? And he said, we've never seen that before. I don't know if that's possible. And I said, well, here's the thing. I want to redo the blood test. If we redo the blood test and the cortisol is still high, we'll talk again. But I'm not doing anything until the blood test is redone. We redo the blood test, all is normal. Why do I bring up this story for you? Because being under stress, for me possibly missing a flight, put so much cortisol into my blood that someone thought I had a brain tumor, okay? So what about the people who are always under that stress? Well, how much cortisol is in their blood? How much are they fighting the hormones that are supposed to be helping them short term? How much are they fighting that now it's long term and it's killing the immune system? It's killing the reproductive system. It's killing the GI system. And I like the word killing because that's what it's doing. Because once you shut off these fibers, you don't allow them to work anymore. And that's what these hormones do long term. You guys with me? That is why you are powerful as a chiropractor. Because every time you adjust someone, you don't just put a bone back in place. You don't just put C1 back in place. Do me a favor. Every time you set up for a toggle recoil from now on, every time you set up for a Gonstead adjustment in the chair, every time you set up for a Thompson adjustment, every time you set up for any chiropractic adjustment, I never ever want you to think that you're just putting something back in place ever again. I want you from now on to think, every time I set up on this, I'm about to reset this person's brain, because that's what you're doing. That is what you're doing. O'Gara study showed in 2011, Plaza study showed in 2014. Every time you adjust the spine, you have a direct effect on the brain. That's already proven. Heidi Havoc's a good friend of mine uh, from New Zealand. She is now doing another study that's showing the same thing, shutting off the areas of the stress of the brain, increasing into what's called the frontal cortex where growth and development happens just by using a chiropractic adjustment. So we always did this but it was just never known how. See, people always say to me, they're like, John, is it your passion to prove that chiropractic works? No, I don't have to prove chiropractic works, it works. My passion is understanding how, so we can educate other people of how powerful we are. Because if we can educate how powerful we are, then people will understand why we should be their first choice, not taking a pill, not taking a hormone, not taking something that will kill them long term, that we should be the number one choice that they should be going to. You with me? The next thing I want to talk about is the effect on this guy here, which is called your hippocampus. And your hippocampus is, is a very important structure in the brain because your hippocampus is involved with memory and learning. Memory and learning. Every time you learn something has to happen here, but most people don't understand that learning is an emotion. Learning, this part of your brain is hooked up with the emotional center of your brain called the limbic system. Every time you learn something, if I can evoke an emotion, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad, I guarantee you'll learn it. If, if you're up here and you're like, this guy's boring, you'll never learn anything I say, ever. But if I can hit an emotion, whether it's good or bad, you will remember anything that you're taught. That's why if I walked up to anyone in this room and I said, tell me about the worst day of your life, instantly you'll remember it. Instantly, you, might, you might say something like, oh, it was the death of my mother. It was, you know, September the 11th and this happened and blah, 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 blah. You go through the entire thing and you'll remember it because that negative impression burned that learning in your brain. Same thing happens with something good. Uh, you know, if I say, tell me about the best thing that ever happened in your life, you might be, oh, the birth of my child, and you'll tell me all about that day. Why? Because learning is an emotion. Another thing about learning, or, or this particular area of your brain, not only is it an emotion, but it's hooked into smell, and it's hooked into hearing. So you guys may have actually um, did this at some point in time. Have you ever walked through a mall? Have you ever walked by through and you smell someone's cologne or perfume that walked by, right? And it reminds you of someone in the past, right? You'd be like, oh yeah, that was John, 2010. He was great, right? Like, I mean, you, you, you instantly, right? You, you instantly go right back to that spot, right? Right? <laughs> I leave a lasting impression, what can I say? <laughs> but you understand what I mean? That was your hippocampus that was, that was uh, doing that whole show. Why do I bring up the hippocampus? Why do I bring up learning and all this kind of stuff? Because what I need you to understand is that cortisol, that last hormone that I talked about, cortisol damages this area of the brain. 
the more cortisol that is in your blood, the harder it is for you to remember anything. That's why when people are under a lot of stress, if you just had a stressful day and someone says, hey, did you remember to pick up milk at the grocery store? You're like, oh my God, totally forgot. You will forget everything when you're under tremendous stress because this area of your brain is actually damaged, damaged by cortisol. So when you adjust people, you can have a direct effect on their learning and memory. Well, how come, John? How can I have effect on learning and memory? Because by stopping cortisol, by you adjusting them and resetting the hormones of their brain and by stopping the release of cortisol, you stop the damage to the hippocampus. And when you stop the damage to the hippocampus, that is when you improve learning. A couple years ago at a Parker seminar in Australia, Fabrizio Mancini talked about um, an internal study that they did at Parker University. And what they did is they gave people a test, they adjusted them, retested them with a, a, a similar a hardness of test, and their memory improved with one adjustment. How is that? How many of us in our offices see children with learning disabilities, see individuals with, people are like, oh no, they're, they're dyslexic, they got all kinds of problems, and then we start adjusting them and all of a sudden, they can learn a lot better, they're much more cooperative in schools. How come? Because you have a direct effect on the brain. You have a direct effect with resetting the hormone system of the brain so that now the area of learning and memory can be reestablished again. It wasn't working properly because they were under so much stress. That subluxation released so much cortisol that they couldn't remember. It's not that they didn't want to, they could not, okay? That is why you're so powerful, and that's why I keep saying if the only thing you take from my presentation is every time you adjust someone, you reset and recalibrate the hormone system of the brain, I'm totally happy with that because that is what you're doing. And that's why for my CAs and for my doctors in this room, anytime anybody ever calls the clinic, walks up to you, does anything, and sits back and says, I heard maybe chiropractic could help with my infant's colic. I heard maybe chiropractic can help with a, a, lear a learning disability with my child. I never want you to doubt again. Never. Because it's proven in science. It's already proven through neurophysiology that that's exactly what we do. If anybody ever calls the clinic and is like, uh -huh, uh -huh, I'm sick, I don't want to get you guys sick, I'll just stay home. I want that response to completely change and say, no, this is when you need the adjustment the most. And they'll say, really? And you'll say, yes, because every time we adjust you, we're going to improve your immune system and get rid of all those stress hormones that, that's beating you up right now. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> now sit back down before security comes. <laughs> but, but no, really, the bottom line is, is you have to understand that you have a direct effect on the brain because if, once you understand this, then you're limitless. Then you are limitless. You're not fixing back pain anymore. You're not fixing headaches anymore. Now, are those byproducts that get better by adjusting? Of course, but that's like, it's like this. I like to use this as an analogy a lot in my clinic. I always say to people, because I'm into fitness a lot, and a lot of people will come into my clinic, they're like, I'm trying to lose five pounds, blah, blah, blah. I always say to them, you know, you don't go to the gym to lose weight. You understand that, right? And they're like, uh, no, that's exactly why I go. And, and I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, no, actually, that's, in, that's inaccurate. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I said, you go to the gym to get healthy. The byproduct of that is that you'll lose weight. The byproduct of that is that your blood pressure will go down. The byproduct of that is that your cholesterol will go down. So you actually go to the gym to get healthy. That is what happens when you go to a chiropractor. You go to a chiropractor to get healthy. The byproduct of that is your headaches will go away. The byproduct of that is colic goes away. The byproduct of that is that you get pregnant. But I'm not adjusting you to get you pregnant. I'm adjusting you to get you healthy, which means this. Every time I adjust you, I'm going to recalibrate your brain the way it should be. Once we recalibrate your brain the way it should be, your brain will take over everything else. People talk about innate intelligence and the power of the body heals the body. That is the brain doing what it's supposed to be doing. And that is how you're powerful because you help the brain out. As soon as you help the brain out, it can do miraculous things. I want to share a monkey study with you. 
And my friend Jeffrey, I told you, was so brilliant, said, that's actually not a monkey, John. It's a chimpanzee. And I'm like, quiet, Jeffrey. You're too smart for your own good, all right? I Googled monkey, and this came up. So that's why I put him up here, okay? <laughs> monkey study. I want to I include this with you. They did a study where they had four monkeys in a cage, okay? And they had a ladder in the cage with bananas on top of the ladder. So, of course, they're monkeys. They notice that bananas are on top of the ladder. One would climb up the ladder to try to get the bananas. But as soon as they did, as soon as one of the monkeys went up the ladder, they soaked the other monkeys with freezing cold water. So the other monkeys figured out quickly that any time a monkey walked up the ladder, we were getting soaked with cold water. So any time a monkey would try to go up the ladder, they were like, we're not getting soaked anymore. So they would jump on the monkey who tried to go up the ladder, and they would beat up the monkey. Well, after a while, everybody got beat up, so they're like, we're not going up the ladder no matter how many, no matter how many bananas are up there, okay? Now they replaced one of the monkeys with a new monkey. So they took out one of the monkeys that were soaked and beat up, and they replaced it with a brand new monkey. Now, you got three of the old, one new. So the new guy comes in and says, hey, there's bananas up here. You guys are idiots. I'm going to go up there and grab the bananas. So as soon as he walked up the ladder, what do you think the other three monkeys did? They jumped on him, right? They jumped on him because they're like, we can't risk us getting soaked with cold water again, so the new guy's going to have to learn the rules around here. You know what I mean? N nobody's going up the banana. Right? And they replaced another monkey. So now you got two and two. When the next new monkey came up to try to do bananas, everybody jumped on him, even the first new monkey, who never got soaked. But he saw everybody else beat up the monkey, so he's like, when in Rome, you know, <laughs> let's beat up the monkey, okay? <laughs> then they replaced another monkey, so now you got one old, three new. Same thing, the new guy tries to go up, everybody jumps on him, beats him up. Then they replaced the last monkey. New monkey comes in, same deal. New monkey comes in, the three that have now all been replaced beat up the new monkey. Not one of them has been soaked with water though, not one. So I bet you if I actually took one of those monkeys out of that cage and said, tell me, why are you beating up that monkey every time he walks up the ladder? Because none of them have been soaked. What would they say? I don't know, that's just how we do things around here. You know what I mean, <laughs> right? Why do I bring this up? Because you will learn things not based on logic. You will learn things based on the environment. You will learn things based on how things are done, good or bad. How many times has this happened in our own clinic? How many times do you just do things because we've always done it that way? Right? How many times has a new CA come into your clinic and they're like, hey, why don't we try this and this? And they're like, mm, shush. We don't do it that way. And they're like, but how come Google's a great thing? We don't use Google in here, right? You don't even know why. You don't even know why, right? But you learned it. So what do you think happens when you tell a kid they're stupid? What do you think happens when you look at a kid and say, you're a loser? You're never going to amount to anything. And you say it again and again and again. What do you think happens to that child? They believe it. They learn it. They think I'm a loser. Is there any reasoning behind it? No, they've just always heard it. Always. That's how learning is. It's reinforced over and over and over again. What we do at the chiropractic adjustment is start to break those neurological connections. We start to break the neurological connection that has just been there for years and years, and we try to replace it with something positive going to the brain. That's why you, as a chiropractor, can literally change an individual's personality, an individual's behavior, just by adjusting them. Do you understand me? That is why you are so powerful as a chiropractor. It's not because you put a bone back in place. It's by putting that bone back in place that has a massive effect on the brain. It's the brain that does everything for you. Another hormone I want to talk about is one called dopamine. And you've probably heard of this in the past, but if you haven't, dopamine is the hormone that's released when you're anticipating something or you really want something. Have you ever had an anticipatory desire for something? You're like, oh my God, hope that guy shows up. Oh my God, hope I win a million dollars, right? Like, it's that anticipation that is dopamine being released. Now, you need dopamine to be happy. Okay, but you need the right amount of dopamine. Too much dopamine, no good. Too little dopamine, no good. 
you have to have the right amount to be happy. And if you lack dopamine, which if you're unhappy, you're lacking dopamine, you know what you'll do? You'll chase dopamine, which means you will do dangerous things to get that rush so that dopamine is released from your brain. So have you ever heard people that are like, oh man, I'm an adrenaline junkie, I drive, dive out of airplanes. No, you're not an adrenaline junkie, you're a dopamine junkie. Get your drugs straight, okay? <laughs> Get your drugs straight. You're a dopamine junkie. For you to stand at the edge of a perfectly good airplane and heave yourself towards the earth, in order for that to happen, you're chasing dopamine and you'll do crazy things in order to happen because it's lacking in your brain. Okay, even people who, who you'll do something naughty, it might be out of your character. So if you've ever had like a one night stand, but it's typically out of your character. What happens if you talk to that individual and they talk to you about the one night stand, what do they usually say? They say, I don't know, I just got caught up in it all. Yeah, you got caught up in the dopamine release of it all. That's dopamine running the show there. Why do I bring this up? Because cortisol decreases dopamine. That stress hormone decreases the hormone you need in your brain to be happy. Do you understand me? Dopamine you need released in order for you to sit back and say, I'm loving life. But cortisol stops that. So is there any doubt why people, when they're subluxating, they're like, oh, I hate life. Yes, they do, because the hormone, one of the hormones that helps them love life is plummeting down the toilet, okay? When you have a lack of dopamine, you'll have things like you'll be unable to move, like, like move properly, like you'll shake, like Parkinson's disease. You'll also have things like ADHD symptoms. That's why chiropractic helps ADHD so much because ADHD, you're allowing the dopamine to be reset in the brain. Do you know what else increases dopamine? A positive CA. A po if, if a CA is just, hey, how are you, John? So good to see you, that releases dopamine. You know what drops dopamine? A dragon CA. <laughs> You're late. We hate you, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's not going to work. So what I need you to understand is this. I like to, my, my time's up. I need, to, I need to wrap up with this. I need you to understand that every time you adjust people, you have a direct effect in the brain, but I need my CAs, my beautiful CAs in this, in this class to also understand this. Your attitude and personality also has direct effects on the individual's healing and their brain. Just by you having a positive attitude, just by you being loving, that helps the healing process because you are the first and last person that everybody sees walking in and out of the office, all right? I wish I could go all day with this. I could talk about it all day. Thank you so much. Never underestimate how powerful you are. Never underestimate how powerful you are. Thank you so much.